that a foreigner, like an international scholar of repute, has been denied the opportunity of speaking tonight because they suddenly, the authorities suddenly said that he needed a work permit. Now this is the country where on a daily basis you have foreigners at, uh, at giving speeches, seminars, forums, conferences. Just in the last two, three months you had Professor Paul Krugman, you had Gary Kasparov. You had, every day you open the papers and there are foreigners speaking and yet there's no mention of a work permit. Next week there is the annual Aslan Shah lecture when uh, famous judges from England come. Next week there is Lord Mans from the House of Lords. I assure you he will not be having a work permit. Now this is censorship of the world's nature. And are you telling me that Malaysia's democracy is so fragile? Is our democracy after 52 years so fragile that the nation will collapse because a foreign academic is not invited? It's absolutely disgraceful and I protest and I say that at the beginning. And that's why I come in. I was asked to stand in at the very last minute. Um, I had actually moved on from the para crisis and I've said, look, I give up. I've lost everything. I want to improve my track record in courts. And that's not going to help my staying in para. But anyway, when Chan Fok Kiong, my friend, asked me, I said, no problem. Because of the shameful way in which the cabin was treated, I'm happy to stand in. But I must request your indulgence because I've only spent a few hours trying to write my notes. So please don't have too high a standard for, for me tonight. Uh, I, of course, I also want to declare my interest at the, uh, at the outset. I acted as counsel for Siva Kumar the legitimately elected speaker of the Para Legislative Assembly who was unlawfully removed by mob action. So if I am not wholly objective, it would be understandable. <laughs> so, so many events have occurred from the 5th of February 2009 that it will be impossible to discuss the entire crisis in the 20 minutes allotted to me. Uh, Shah Farooqi has identified 13 issues and I think there could be more. What I therefore propose to consider in, the, in this limited time is a role, is look at the role of four institutions that are intended to be neutral, impartial and independent and institutions that are meant not to take sides, institutions that are meant not to be partisan in a clash between political parties. But before I go there, can I just remind all of you of the critical and fundamental facts of this case, of this crisis, which is that in the historic general elections of March 2008, the results in Perak were as follows. The share of the popular vote was Pakatan got 53.8%, which gave them 31 seats. The Barisan at 46.2%, which gave them 28 seats. So uh, having a, a three-seat majority in a house of 59 is a comfortable working majority. And you will remember that in the, past, uh, the past government in Kelantan over the years have survived on a one-seat majority. So three is very comfortable. And if you look at the popular vote, 53.8 to 46.2, that is a tremendously respectable uh, popular vote margin. And I say that because you must never forget about those facts. What did the people want? How did they cast their ballots? And how was it represented at the floor? Now, I must disagree with Shah Farooqi on many, many issues uh, on, on this crisis, but that's expected. Lawyers are never expected to agree. I start off by saying that it is wrong to say that you must enter an election as a coalition. You don't have to. In many, many, many countries, the bargaining only takes place after the results. There, uh, Italy, Japan, India, in India, they, they do all this horse trading after the elections. So, as long as somebody can come and say, look, uh, monarch or president or whatever, I have a working majority, uh, that must be recognized. So, to me, there was absolutely no question about who, which party was to, go to, was to form the government in March uh, 2008, and that was the Pakatan government. And then we come to March, uh, uh, February of this year. The critical facts are three Pakatan assemblymen switched sides, the hoppers. 
Two of them, Jamaluddin and Inche Osman, were facing criminal charges. Um, the, the, then there is late, Miss He, the, the, late, the, the famous or notorious Lady Hopper. And finally, the, Bo the Bota Assemblyman, whose name I don't know, but he comes from the assembly, uh, the constituency called Bota, which is really uh, remarkable for memory purposes. Now, this gentleman switched twice. So on Monday morning, Monday morning he is um, in Amno. On Tuesday he is in Pakatan. On Wednesday he goes back to Amno. Now, this kind of people, what kind of credibility do you give to this kind of people? So my, my starting point is that when you are faced with an invitation to dissolve, which was the invitation made to the monarch, the conduct of these three gentlemen should be disregarded. I say, look, you are clouds. You are real clouds and I'm not taking you into account. And the Bota man is the best example. So with that as an essential factual background, can I very quickly go into the four institutions? And the first institution is the royalty. Now, however wide the discretion may be that the Sultan of Perak enjoys under Article 16.6 of the Perak Constitution to remove a popularly elected Menteri Busar that the Sultan had himself appointed a year before, two cardinal features of a Westminster type parliamentary democracy are paramount. The first is that the Sultan, in common with the eight other Malay rulers, the young Diputuan Agong at the federal level and the four governors. So we have 13 at the state and one at center. All four of them, uh, all 14 of them, are constitutional monarchs or constitutional rulers, as the case may be, whose rights, privileges, and responsibilities are circumscribed under the federal and state constitutions. That thus they are only formal rulers invariably acting on advice. They are not dictators and they are not meant to be presidents of republics. The second critical uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, Westminster type feature is that the real power flowing from proposition number one is that the real power lies in the hands of the executive who are all elected legislators, legislators and indirectly in the electorate who elected them and to whom the legislators are accountable at least once in four or five years during elections. That is the will of the people, which is what is democratic. So those two critical features, I suggest, must be kept uppermost in the mind when you look at all these issues um, that Shah identified and more, more. Flowing from that, consequently, it is my case that the best decision or the least controversial decision that a constitutional monarch can take in the 21st century. Bear in mind, in the 21st century, we've got lessons of history in the last 1500 years in Malaysia and elsewhere. Can take in such circumstances is to dissolve the legislature and, uh, and ask and call, and insist on fresh gen elections, thereby allowing the will of the people to prevail. In other words, it is the governor those who are ruled and no one else who must choose the governor, the people must choose the rulers. And when that decision is not taken, as it wasn't taken in February, you have all these repercussions. Now, the removal of popularly elected leaders is neither novel nor limited to Malaysia. And of course, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Shah Farooq has mentioned Gough Whitlam. Now, that is perhaps the most notorious recent example that is the unceremonious dismissal of uh, Gough Whitlam by Governor General John Carr in 1975 and the appointment of Malcolm Fraser to take his place. Now, what um, Prof did tell you to complete the story is that when this happened in 1975, the sitting Chief Justice Garfield Barwick wrote an opinion to the government which caused him problems because of separation of power, but more importantly, that, that decision of Governor General John Carr was so controversial, absolutely controversial, he died in disgrace. Queen Elizabeth, who is the monarch and who is actually the Queen of Australia, and John Carr is the vice regal representative of the Queen, she was most embarrassed. And of course, the Queen, when, when she's embarrassed, she just washes her hands off and says, Look, 
John Carr, what John Carr did had nothing to do with me. So the lesson from the Gus Whitlam episode to any constitutional scholar from 1975 is please do not follow that route. And I assure you, no Governor General in Australia will ever, ever go the John Carr route. So the lesson to be learned is not to do what John Carr did. And that is the lesson. And unfortunately, we didn't learn from that lesson. Now, because that was not done in Para, the institution, and I put it very mildly, the institution of the royalty has been the subject of public criticism 